which tells you that enter the road for him. Yeah, we're taxiing at the lake here. We'll be uh, going west on to uh, Thompson Lake. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Advisory. Today I'm here to share my adventures of what uh, I went through here in the last 15 years of all the great fun, struggles, fears. I hope you guys are going to enjoy this video. Let's go. Thompson Lake is located on the 56 parallel latitude in northern Saskatchewan, Canada. Its nearest community is located 35 miles east and is only accessible by air or snow machine. So, my adventure really started in 1990 as a young kid at 11 years old. Uh, little did he realize what he'd be getting into with his father. And the first thing before we came up here for the full time winter was I wanted a dog and cat. So, dad found me a dog and he found me a cat six months later. The dog was named Bobo, it was a half wolf husky mix. And the cat, I don't know what Kitty was. And funny enough, we never really found a name for Kitty. She was referred to Kitty, stupid, moron, uh, dozy, dozy because she used to sleep in the gas shed. We never really had a name for the cat, but yet the cat almost outlived every one of us. Uh, this is kind of where we uh, used to store all our traps for the winter time. <laughs> because it was cold, <coughs> Dad would chop up the bait at the filleting shed, and we'd always keep the bait here, keep our sleds. Um, the guns used to go in the corner there, where there used to be no door there. But uh, that's uh, where we kept everything. And this is the same table. And actually, my uncle Lawrence gave this table uh, to my dad back in the 80s. I don't know if it was a gift for uh, uh, for the lodge. I'm not sure how that came to be, but I know this came from my uncle, and this table is still here. The only difference is this table used to lay crosswise this way and I used to sit right here as a kid and I used to do my schoolwork and I used to open this window it's still the same 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 window and I used to get a nice fresh air breeze while I used to do my math my English and pretend that I was actually busy while dad worked outside and he looked over to make sure I was sitting there doing something on the paperwork when the fact is I was reading aviation magazines or field and string but this used to be the living room, and I have to say they, they brightened it up because we used to have that old board that was dark brown. It used to be really dark in here. There used to be a couch, and this is no kidding in the lie. Uh, the couch has since got thrown out, but that couch, everybody felt Elvis Presley actually sat on that couch. And it came from a studio in L.A. back in the 60s. It went to the studio my dad had in Calgary. And it stayed here until we sold the lot. The TV, our little TV where we watched North of 60 and NYPD Blue, that was my dad's favorite TV shows, uh, was here for the little time we did watch TV or the time we did have time to watch TV. And all the radio communications used to be right here. Uh, that's where we had the HF radio, the ham radio, uh, and everything. And there used to be a bookshelf there with the uh, whole encyclopedia sets, what I think they call Google today. It hasn't changed in the lodge since we sold it in 2006 is this part. Everything here is exactly the way it was. The same bunk beds, same mattresses, I think even the same blankets. Um, so yeah, this is this was the guest area. And over there was their little porch. They could hang out, there used to be a table there. And the last place I wanted to show you was, there's a bit of a story to this. Dad, when that mining camp got salvaged, uh, Dad had a bunch of extra lumber that came to him from the whole deal. And uh, it was about, I think it was June of 95, if I recall right. Dad woke up one day and said, I'm going to build an upstairs. And being a 13, 14 year old boy, I said, are you, are you bloody insanely crazy, Dad? He said, yeah. He said, Dad, you can't even, you can't even nail a freaking 2 by 4 uh, without measuring it wrong. Are you going to build an upstairs? Oh, yeah. I said, oh my god. Okay, so sure enough, he, he said, oh, you don't have to get involved, you can do the chores. And I thought, yeah, well, you're absolutely right. Sure enough, I got dragged into it, and uh, I remember I was sitting out there looking at Dad, and he's got a chainsaw, and he's cutting a hole in the roof that already leaked. And I was like, Jesus Christ, Dad. Like, what the hell? Anyway, contrary to me bugging him, about two weeks later, and thank God there was no rain, um, this is what came to be. And actually, it came to be my upstairs bedroom. 
Unfortunately, in the winter time, we never heated it because it only had R12 roof. Uh, so it wasn't very really practical for heating in the winter. But for summertime, sure made a fun little uh, uh, playhouse, I guess you can call it, slash bedroom. It was a way of getting away from my dad. So it was my hideout. And that uh, turned out all right. It became the highlight of the lodge, so to speak. And that was dad's highlight of project. He was really, really proud he did it. And I think he knew in the deep in the back of his mind that I was correct. What the hell is he doing building it upstairs? Because uh, you gotta remember, guys, we are 63 air miles away from the nearest store. I can't, if we forget something, we can't just go to the hardware store and purchase it. Well, I mean, you could. The airplane to bring up here back in those days for 185 was $350. And that was in the 90s. That same 185 today is about eight, nine hundred dollars for that 60 mile trip. So for three bolts or some road roofing or whatever, it's gonna be a minimum of $400. So that becomes really expensive. There was no time for uh, mistakes. And uh, that was one thing my dad had a difficult time at the beginning, was trying to figure out how much food. We used to get an airplane in once every three months. And how much food do we actually need? And finally, after about doing it for a couple of years and making a few minor mistakes, he did really well. I can't remember or recall anything that we were seriously short on. But he eventually had a grocery list made where he would go on the radio telephone and tell co-op the same order every three months and they would just ship it up. And we used to go in every six months. So third three months, the plane would come here, drop our supplies off. The next plane would pick us up. We'd go to town for about a week, uh, come back. Another three months, plane comes in, supply plane. And then when the one year came up, which was usually around July, we used to go out for a couple weeks, just get out of here, uh, go visit our, some of our family and friends in Saskatoon, and then come back about two weeks later. We'd usually this is the famous 10-foot dish. When we uh, decided to call it quits in Saskatoon and move up, Dad hauled this dish. And I remember he was talking to a bunch of satellite experts. And actually, one used to work at HEL Music, which was right by Audio Art. And the guy actually was part of the engineering design for the Annex satellites back in the 60s. And they were doing testing in Arizona. And he told Mike, he says, you need a 10-foot dish if you got any hope of wanting to watch TV where you're located here. And uh, one of the problems back in those days, all the dishes were fiberglass. Well, you're not going to haul a 10-foot satellite dish fiberglass on an airplane. Uh, <laughs> so we found a dish, and they weren't common back in the day, that splits. And actually, this was bought from the old CTV uh, TV station out of Saskatoon. I forget their call sign, but I know it was CTV. And Dad unbolted it. And uh, we took it up to the lodge and we, from a few of his ham buddies, he found an old uh, satellite receiver and an LNA and a feed horn. And I helped him bolt this thing together. And we, we didn't know what we were gonna get, uh, if anything. And we had this old black and white TV and the generator was running over there. And sure enough, we line it up and we get a signal. And the first TV station I will never forget was MTV. We were sitting right down here and we were dancing with some pop Michael Jackson music. I don't know what it was, but we were so happy to see TV at Thompson Lake. <laughs> okay, we're here at the, the back of the lodge. This is where uh, the charging bank used to be of batteries. Uh, there used to be a lot of the old Sastel 2 volt batteries along with big deep cycle 12 volt batteries where we uh, got our main power from. Uh, at the time, there was no such thing as solar panels. At least you had twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and they weren't really efficient. So this left us for a couple of charging solutions. The first one was a generator. Uh, we could start the generator up and charge the batteries, but you'd run the generator for four or five hours. The problem is you go through a gallon of gas, and I know you're probably thinking, well, what's the big deal? A gallon of gas is only like two, three dollars. Even back in the days, probably less. But you got to fly it up. So that two, three dollars was about ten dollars a gallon. So gas was like, it was special. You didn't waste it. Um, so, I mean, we ran the generator for washing clothes, welding, or anything that was really high powered current. Uh, for everything else, we tried to run the radios, the TV, uh, and everyday things off the battery bank. How did we charge the batteries besides the generator? We had two wind chargers, and we're gonna go up to them right now. And uh, what it was, it was an old 28 volt tractor generator. And the lower RPMs would produce 15, 16 volts at about 20 amps and uh, supply electrical. We never regulated anything. We were the regulator. 
we would just watch how high the voltage was on the batteries. Because if we regulated everything, the problem is it takes six, seven, eight, nine hours to charge everything. And again, <laughs> especially when you're running on a generator, you can't afford nine hours of gas. So we bypassed the regulators and everything. And yes, it did shorten the life of our batteries. However, uh, if we figured out bringing fuel in versus replacing batteries more often, it was way cheaper to replace batteries more often. And we had those Sastel batteries down there, those two volt Sastel batteries, which lasted us about 14 years. So that helped. The other wind charger, we won't bother going to, but it was just way down there. So we kind of captured the wind from this direction, but wouldn't capture too good of a wind this way, which is your south wind. So that charger would capture a really good southwest wind or southeast wind, and this would capture a really good west uh, southwest winds. So the both chargers kind of work together. And uh, I think around the year 2000, I finally, when I moved into town, I bought dad a solar panel, but the solar panels finally came reasonably priced, and I bought them a 50 watt for $400, and that really helped them out. And also when DBS satellite came in, flat screen TVs, laptop computers, you know, all that drew so much less current. And uh, we were able to, uh, you know, watch a lot, you know, he was able to watch a lot more TV, or, you know, you keep the radio on longer, without worrying about how he's going to charge the batteries the next day. So, you know, times have changed. And the nice thing about it today, guys, with today's technology, with our smartphones and uh, low-powered, low-powered input, high-powered RF uh, satellite internet systems, you could easily live at the lodge like a regular person with running water, with the efficient water pumps they got for RVs now, you can live just like you do in uh, Candle Lake or Saskatoon and have all the luxuries without running the generator very much, if any at all. Uh, times have changed so much in the power world. And definitely living off the grid of the grid, off the grid, it's definitely a lot easier today. My mom, when she passed away, she asked to be put at Thompson Lake. So, of course, we, we went out here. As you remember, we were out here with Tanya at the time. We put her, at, put her ashes there. My dad was a different story, and actually, it's a weird story. Some people say, you know, when you die, you pass away, that's it, it's over. I don't believe that. Maybe at one time I actually did, but I've got this, this honest to God, the truth story. So, when dad came back, his ashes came back from overseas from his heart attack. Um, he wanted uh, his ashes to be spread. And matter of fact, I can show you on his will. It stated, quote unquote, anywhere north of the Churchill River. Dad didn't want his ashes necessarily spread it at a specific location. Just anywhere north of Black Bear was good for him. And um, so the one day me and Daryl Burr, we took off and we headed, uh, headed up here and it was beautiful weather. Absolutely sun, minus 10 degrees centigrade. It was November 28th. And the reason why I wanted to do it November 28th, because after that, there was a cold front coming in the following week. And I just wanted to, to get my dad's uh, ashes spreaded and, uh, you know, and uh, let him rest. So we flew up and we took off. And it, Travis, it was absolutely beautiful sunny weather. And uh, we were only flying at 2,200 feet, which is roughly about 800 feet above the ground. So we were flying very low, considering. So... <laughs> Anyhow, we get to the Churchill River, and honestly, there was like this fog of haze that went right from the ground, right up to the top of the hills here. That was it. Anything above, blue sky. So I'm still flying at 2,200 feet, and um, I'm still clearing this, we'll call it cloud layer, by at least five, 600 feet. So there was no, no issues. When one problem came up, because I originally wanted to spread my dad's ashes over Thompson. Well, I don't know where Thompson Lake is. It's, it's cloud below me. 
So I said, well, I'll use the GPS. And when I get to zero miles, and it was one of those GPS's where you didn't uh, have a lake like a map. It's one of those old ones where you put the coordinates in, latitude, longitude of the approximate area, and you went to it and you got here. So I remember coming to what we call ground zero, 0, 0.00 miles. Everything is cloud. You can't see anything. And um, we opened up the window. And the first thing I learned is you don't throw out ashes slowly because half of dad came back in the cockpit and, and half of the instrument panels was full of ash. So sorry, dad, he just went. After that, just sorry, dad, you're gone. And out the window he went. And honestly, Travis, I couldn't tell you where his ashes ended up. And that's the way dad was. Anybody that knew my dad knew that he was never the guy that had anything specific or wanted to be in a specific place at any specific time. He was an adventurer and he went out as an adventurer. And uh, that makes him one of the most awesome people I've ever known. And, uh, and you know, where the story kind of ends a little weird, uh, and maybe spiritual, if you're a spiritual kind of guy, is flying back. We flew back again, everything clear, cleared up over the Churchill River, flying back inbound to Larange, and uh, there was a skid run from Key Lake. And the skid run from Larange to Key Lake always comes over Thompsonville, all the time. And I said to the guys on the radio, did you notice that cloud bank? I said, I've never seen a phenomenon like that. And uh, they radioed back and kind of thought it was a little cuckoo because they said, well, we don't know what you're talking about. Here's clear blue, there's clear blue skies all the way from Key Lake, all the way back over La Ranch. And me and Daryl Barr, we looked at each other and uh, we just we just nodded and we just let it be. We didn't argue anything. And, uh, you know, I think that was kind of dad's way of saying hello. You'll have to come up with something else. See, you're, you're good at coming up with these ideas. I just, I just take them a step further. <laughs>
And you can see that we're going to come across kind of a Muskegee River area. We crossed that. And that's when the trail started being built. So the trail is starting to be built on the shoreline that you're actually seeing right now. And uh, this is when we actually stumbled into the other portage. Now again, we, I was just mentioning earlier that we didn't know about. So we followed that portage, and that's about right where my plane is right now, banked. And we started heading this heading. I'm going to ride along where those uh, yellow leaves are in the trees. Beautiful area there. I actually ended up trapping there in my later years, so I tried it out for a season. Really beautiful area. And we came across this creek, and we crossed it, and uh, we followed it. Okay, so from there on in, we kind of follow the portage that goes towards the Drew Lake, uh, which would be on the opposite side here, and then we cut over. And we started cutting this trail, going up this hill. You can actually see a nice beautiful hill here, and we just pulled right along this hill. And if you actually look, you can actually see Thompson Lake and Muskrat Lake from the top of this hill. So this trail continued being cut, and up on around the peak of this hill, right about here, uh, one of our dogs there named Heidi, a uh, collie lab, ran off, and we heard her squeal really, 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 really bad. And then there was no noise, and we tried calling her, and we calling her, and we calling her, and we thought she got killed uh, by, uh, you know, wolves, we would have assumed. Fifteen minutes later, she uh, she reappeared, and I've never been so happy to see a dog in my life. I was bawling my eyes out, so happy with joyful tears. She got stung by a few wasps, I assume, but she wasn't hurt. So we always called that Heidi Hill, and uh, we're actually coming up to the lake that we finally made it to. And this went on, this trail making kept going on, on and off for about two, three weeks. But finally about halfway, so right when where Heidi got, uh, got stung, um, we had to start, you know, spending the night. So we continued cutting, and we made it to this little lake, which is a really a no-name lake here. And uh, I actually named this lake uh, Heidi Lake. Uh, that's what I named it. And actually, where I'm circling is where we spend the night. And somewhere in there, there's a plot. We accidentally left a plot behind. And you can see there's a really beautiful forest in here. It really is just absolutely wonderful. It is a really beautiful area of, uh, of Saskatchewan. So the next morning we got up and we had breakfast. And uh, we went, just, we followed right along the shoreline of this lake here. And we stayed on the east shore. And we just walked right along the shoreline as best we could. We didn't really interest at that point of cutting a portage. Uh, we weren't sure. I mean, it was 15 miles. And, you know, reality, we weren't even sure Dad was going to do with this lake, if anything. But again, he was exploring. So we just kind of uh, got our way through there. And uh, we finally uh, came up to this uh, lake here. And actually, what we didn't realize when we got to the, uh, to the shoreline of this, first lake, there's actually a portage that runs along the cliffs there. And a uh, nice little portage. So, you know, there's obviously trapping happening, or was. And my dad threw a few casts, he caught a couple jacks, never did catch a trout, but he admitted that this is one of the more beautiful lakes he's seen. Just absolutely wonderful. If I was to build a cabin, and if I could build a cabin, this would be the lake I would build it on. Uh, yeah, we had our frustrating moments, but thanks to uh, GPS technology, which was just coming out at that time at an affordable price, it made it possible to get here because it's so easy to get twisted up uh, up on these uh, hills. And, uh, you know, you can have a good map, but the reality is the maps aren't really that accurate. They are the most deceptive animal I have ever met. They have destroyed trap lines. Uh, they have destroyed cabins. They have no mercy for anything or anyone. 
and are probably be, to be known as one of the meanest animals in the north. One day, uh, coming to check my traps, and like I've mentioned, we used to bring the snow machine all the way around and stop it right here in the bay and walk the walk our trap lines. Um, so I'm coming up here, and I, I noticed this trap is all messed up. And I thought, oh, great, I must have a, have a fisher. So um, I stopped the snow machine, and I'm coming up here, and uh, I see this animal actually drag, tore the whole set apart and dragged it back there. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at it, and it started to look, it, it jerked, and then it looked at me, and it started going towards me. I'm like, what the heck is that? The first thing that came to my mind, all like within seconds, is it's not a fisher, it's not a mink. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it's charging towards me. The problem is, I had one of these short barrel 22 cooies, and those damn things couldn't shoot 50 feet if your life depended on it. I grabbed this little short Kui 22 and I'm putting the shells, and of course it's one of those single shells, so I'm pulling out ammo and I'm dropping more ammo on the snow. And this thing is starting to lurch towards me and it's growling and making funny sounds. Finally, I put the shell in, I pulled the thing, and it broke off the set, and it was coming right towards me. And, poof, and right there, it lay dead. And I come walking up to it, and I'm thinking, okay, what is it? And I realized, so I'm looking at all my wrecked trap set, like my whole whole trap set is set. And I noticed that the, the two big traps were destroyed. And it was caught on the little squirrel set. And I'm thinking, how lucky am I? Those squirrel sets, I mean, even if you trapped your own hands in them, you could pull them out. We're talking about a wolverine here. That animal can pull two, three hundred pounds in sudden movements if it wants to. It breaks into cabins, it goes down chimneys, it rips windows open, rips doors open. I'm amazed that it didn't escape even before I got here with the snow machine. So, <laughs> I got this wolverine, I realized again, you know, nobody catches a wolverine, never mind a kid. So I put it on my sled and I took it took it back to uh, to the lodge and my dad was checking out his Sean's like uh, trap sets and uh, he couldn't believe it. And I usually skin my own fur, but that time I asked my dad to do it because he was way better, better at skinning. And uh, I ended up getting about $700 for that fur pelt. So it was good, but uh, I can say in my trapping career, I got a Wolverine. That's a very rare thing. So years ago, this used to be my old trap line here. Uh, this is the portage that goes from the uh, north, north easterly end of Thompson Lake to uh, the south, uh, I guess you'd call it the south end of Freezing Lake. Um, this became my dedicated trap line here for about seven years. So today we're taking a walk down it to see if we can see any of my old cubby sets still. 18 years since my last walk on this portage and 19 years since I've trapped. Anyway, in the old days we were allowed to legally use leg hold traps and I used to build my cubby hole. Matter of fact, you can see some of the sticks still here. I would build a cubby hole and I've caught many lynx and fisher because the fish would always come through the water here along the edge. And uh, sometimes you even get the odd otter um, or mink. So this is always one of my better trap sets. So we're just walking what I call the crossover trail from the regular portage that uh, we were just on to the dark side portage. There's two portages that actually go from Thompson Lake to Friesen, the one, the regular portage and the dark side one. So this used to be my little trapping crossover. We never used snow machines back in my day. We'd always take the snow machine up to uh, the lake where I parked the plane. And from there, everything was done by foot because game don't like snow machine tracks. Okay, we're officially here at the dark side now. We came over our crossover trail. And there's kind of a story here. There was this old bear. We actually nicknamed him Thor. It was from a novel. I forget what novel, but it was a northern, northern book anyway. And there was a big grizzly named Thor. Maybe some of you guys might know who the bear I'm talking about. There was an old brown bear. And uh, we named him. We named him after that bear from the novel. And he left us alone. You know, normally old bears will leave humans alone. It's the two-year-old's and the mama bears that you gotta be careful with. They're the most dangerous. We knew he was around. Big tracks, everything was huge. We know, and dad, I never seen him, but dad seen him. And the bear, when he was standing, was about eight feet tall. That gives you an idea, that's a huge brown bear. Anyhow, this guy that was coming up to our fishing camp, named Terry, 
he wanted to go bow hunting. He came up a couple of years fishing and he heard about this Thor. And he made it determined that we we're going to get this Thor. And I was kind of against it because it's on my trap line, but Dad kind of said, well, you know, we could use the extra money. I said, that's fine, that's fine, whatever. But I said, you know what, if you guys are going to hunt the spare, at least have a gun with you. So that if the bow hunting doesn't go right, um, you can shoot it. Terry came out here and Dad set him up. What I didn't realize, Dad kind of left for a bit. I don't know exactly, I can't remember all the details. And actually, uh, if he's swinging the camera around, just up on this hill here, he was sitting on this tree, facing down towards where I'm at. And he sat there for hours. And this bear came up from over here, and he shot the bone arrow, and it hit the bear. And Thor took off, leaving a blood trail. Anyway, where's Mike? Terry said, because Terry wasn't gonna go in with a bow with a wounded bear. And so finally Mike came back, my dad, and uh, they started walking the trail here, and the blood kind of vanished. So they came back, they got me, and of course I'm really teed off. And I said, way to go guys. So you shot an old bear that was leaving me alone. I could walk this trail without any issues. So now he knows that human has wounded him. I said, boy, really smart one, guys. So uh, we never did ever find Thor, but I know he lived, because I seen his tracks. And I can tell you guys, that bear wasn't happy to see humans. Uh, why I say that? Because one time I was out there and I heard him cracking in the bush with a big grumbling, roaring sound. You want to talk about a guy that loaded his gun real quick, but he never charged me. And he just took off and uh, never seen him again. If you want to kill a bear, you go for it. Use proper ammunition. I'm not into animal cruelty whatsoever. And I'm also not into this whole filming I've seen this a lot on Facebook and social media and YouTube where, you know, if the bear comes towards us and we shoot it, it's sitting there wounded and the camera guy goes up to it thinking it's funny. And there's nothing funny about thinking an animal's life. Uh, just so we're very clear on this, uh, you've lived in the bush for 25 years like I have. I've seen death more often than you ever. That boat that you guys seen back earlier, the, uh, the one set there, the trap set that I was showing you at Friesen Lake, I remember I was about seven or eight years old and uh, we didn't have snow machines back in those days. Uh, this is before we lived year round. And dad wanted to get a boat at the freezing. And I clearly remember him, the water levels were high at Thompson. He brought it along the creek here. And I was about, yeah, about eight years old walking with the gun along this trail as dad kept pushing it and I would help him while he got stuck. We're at uh, the end of the dark bay. This is actually this river here that flows into Thompson Lake where the boat came through. Uh, Freezing Lake is just right there. That would be the south uh, east end. And I used to have a cubby set just over there, and I used to have a cubby set right by those rocks there too. Good for bank and fisher. Uh, beautiful, and the odd otter that would come through. It was a really good area here. Even though trapping wasn't always fun, it was a part of my life, and it brought food to the table and kept the lanterns lit. Many days fighting the elements, breaking through the ice, getting surrounded by wolves, snow machines breaking down, almost costing my life. This was my job, it's all I knew. Looking back, I wouldn't have traded it for anything else. I surely do miss it. So what happened to Jared after he left the lodge in 2000? How did he feel? What was life like in town? In a nutshell, it took a lot of learning, a lot of, a lot of learning. And I've had a few friends to help me through uh, getting adjusted to civilization. And one of the things that really, really stood out for me was how people lie in the city. It's like an everyday thing. And at the lodge, we never lied. Uh, there was, you couldn't, it could kill you. Do you remember, you're in the middle of nowhere. We're 60 miles, as I mentioned. And if something happens, somebody lies and somebody gets hurt or worse, you're looking at two to three hours minimum before an aircraft will get you to a hospital. And that's weather permitting. You know, like I, like, you know, if we uh, had a supply plane here, like even when we bought our airplanes to go fly out, we book it for a Wednesday. And a lot of times we wouldn't even get out to Saturday, Sunday sometimes uh, due to weather. So you didn't mess around. If you made a mistake or you got hurt, uh, you were up front with it. And you dealt with it right now, right then. We were very lucky. Uh, not once. Uh, there has been a couple close calls. 
I had to one time call the uh, over the radio mobile telephone system a doctor for advice when dad had a really bad toothache and I got really bit up once uh, by my dog uh, because I tried to be a hero and try to rescue her and then she was caught in a little squirrel trap and you know what young boy doesn't want to help their dog and well dogs you know <laughs> they don't like sometimes being helped and I got really bit up here and you know I come back and dad knew something was wrong and I covered it up I wouldn't tell him at first and finally he said raise your arm and uh, oh he, he went into panic mode uh, because everything was blue and swelled up and the weather was out we couldn't even get an airplane probably couldn't even get a helicopter in but uh, luckily our doctor uh, gave us some extra antibiotics, really powerful antibiotics for exact situations like this for emergency, a kind of a broad spectrum antibiotic. And that got me on double doses of that and everything turned out okay. So again, you know, there's no room for mistakes living in the North. And that's one of the things that has been stressed to me since a kid. I mean, yeah, people kind of laugh why we're so cautious. You know, why take the gun to the to the outhouse or take the gun to the garbage dump? That, that's a game. You know, nobody does. Tourists come here, they don't do that. Because if you get into that one situation where a bear charges you, it could be between life and death. So that's, uh, that was uh, some of the adjustments of getting used to in the city that people just are careless. At least what I would consider careless. I've always been on the cautious side and probably still am on the cautious side. And that's only because it's been pounded into me. Uh, living in the north as long as I have. We're at Allen Lake, uh, our outpost, or used to be outpost. Uh, we used to come here about three times a year, four times. We never really came here too often. Dad always wanted to come out here more often, but uh, just never really had the chance. Anyway, this portage is famous. This is the portage that I was uh, confronted between a mama bear and her cubs. And today we're going to take a visit to that exact spot where I'm going to share my bear encounter story, much like it was when it happened back in 1998. Ironically, it was about the same yeah, time. Dad wanted to come up here at five in the morning and uh, clean this portage. He already cleaned the first one and he wanted to get the second portage cleaned. So he got me up and we started heading out and it was a beautiful, calm, foggy morning. I clearly, clearly remember that. So we get to the first portage and we, nothing, nothing, you know, everything going perfectly routine. Get to the boat, bail out, get it started. We only had about a five horsepower motor. So it took us about half an hour to get down to the end here. And uh, finally get here and we're sitting here right now. We load up our backpacks and dad has got his knife. I got my knife and there's only one gun. And I said to dad, I said, well, what are we gonna do? There's only one gun. He said, well, look, go to the boat, get it ready and uh, come back. I said, yeah, that's great. But where, what do we do? We only got one gun. And uh, he says, oh, just take the gun. Don't worry about it, I got a knife, I'll beat the bear up with it. He kind of said jokingly. Now keep in mind, I've been down these trails for 10 years, three, four times a year, never seen bears. And I've been down so many portages, you kind of wonder if there's even bears. You see the odd bear poop, but you just never see them. So I said to dad, well, I don't know, what else I meet a bear? He said, okay, look, we'll put the gun halfway. Well, the problem is, well, half ways to me is going to be different to half ways what Dad thinks or even my, my cameraman here, Travis. But, okay, so here's what we did. I grabbed my stuff and I started heading. Dad stayed behind and he started to clean the sporter. So we continued walking here, or I continued walking, I should say. And the thing being a trapper, you know, we have a tendency of always looking down. And the reason is because we're always looking for traps. Um, it's just kind of a thing that's kind of programmed into you for years of trapping. You never have a tendency of looking up. I come up to this spruce tree over here, and I thought to myself, well, this is a pretty good, uh, a pretty good spot, halfway here. So I put the gun down, and I remember thinking to myself, boy, Quote on quote words, wouldn't it be funny if I met up with a bear today? Nah, not gonna happen. I haven't seen a bear in 15 years. Why the hell would I see one now? By these two trees, and suddenly, there's a lot of cracking over there, and this bear leaps out right out of nowhere, and it comes right for me, and I froze. 
and it sat about 20 feet away, and the bear then started marching towards me, and I screamed, get away from me, get away from me, and the bear backs off a little bit, and I said, stay the hell away from me, get away from me, and I'm like, okay, I don't have anything, but I got this bull motor hose, the bear comes along again, at full charge, and stands up on the legs, and I said, get away, get away, and I hit the bear over the nose, and actually I cut its nose, and the bear backs off about 30 feet. So I'm thinking now, well, what can I do? And I think, Dad, Dad, where are you? <laughs> Meanwhile, my dad is hearing the cries, and the first thing that comes to his mind is he got stung by a wasp because there's been known to be some big wasp nests around here. So he drops his knife and he starts running. The first thing that hits his mind, where did Jared put the gun? <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm here, and I start backing up. I'm thinking, okay, Mike, let's slowly back up. Maybe the bear won't be so annoyed. Sure enough, the bear comes at me again. And it comes and I start yelling, get away, get away! And I keep yelling, and the bear backs off again. And I realize any movement I make, the bear starts getting mad and its fur in the back starts standing up. So I say, Dad, Dad, get over here! There's a bear! So finally, the bear, the bear comes again a third, fourth time. And this time I realize I'm out of negotiating skills and this is going to be a full blown charge. And I'm ready to defend myself. And just when that happens, Dad comes right from behind with two gunshots. Right the air. The bear stops right here, halts its break. Its butt turns around right here and it takes off for about right up to that, that poplar tree that's bent. So about maybe 50 feet. And it sits there looking at us. And I can't figure out why is the bear so agitated. So we back up and Dad lets me back up. He's got the gun right here. And we're backing up to about, oh, probably right about here. And we could see two baby cubs and one on this side. Three baby cubs was really unusual. And uh, we realized I got between the mama bear and her cubs. So we backed off a few more feet here. And uh, maybe a little bit further than that. We kind of came back to probably about 150 yards. And we'll just back up here. And we stayed there with the gun, of course, fully loaded, ready to, defend, you know, protect ourselves. And the little cubs just came down. We could have easily destroyed that bear. Uh, we had every right to. But the way we looked at it is that bear let me live that, uh, that day. She had no right to. She could have easily killed me. Uh, we let her live and let the baby cubs grow up to uh, chew gasoline hoses and drink lots of gasoline out of uh, jerry cans. They love gas in the boats. So that was my uh, bear story. It was actually published uh, on CBC. Uh, I was actually on a CBC radio interview. And no, I don't really have the answer to what to do in a bear attack. Each situation is different. Uh, I don't necessarily say the way I did it was right. Uh, it just kind of kept me alive for those few minutes while dad uh, uh, came to save me. But eventually I know I would have gotten attacked. It was just a matter of time. I was just trying to uh, bike time and hope dad heard me, which he did, because I'm here. Aviation. It's always been in my blood since the age of three. My first experience was George Flatland picking me up and strapping me in the front right seat of a Cessna 180. Uh, he was flying me to LaRange so my mom could pick me up because I had to go for a hernia operation. And I really recall sitting in that airplane and how much I love flying. Ever since then, flying has been in my blood. Through my years of schooling, when I was supposed to be doing my math, I was drawing pictures of airplanes or reading airplane books from the ground up, aviation regulations. When I had a chance to meet a pilot, I would ask him questions or even challenge him to the regulations. One of the funny stories I do remember is age 12 or 13 years old, a single auto pilot was really tired and he had a long day flying. And uh, he said, Jared, take the controls. And I did, and we're flying to Thompson Lake, and uh, he was having a nap, and all of a sudden the fuel warning was coming on. And I was like, uh-oh. So I, I tapped him on the shoulder, and I showed him, and uh, he just looked and reached down, switched the fuel valves, and said, okay, we're looking good. Yeah, good. Wake me up. And sure enough, we, uh, we got to Thompson Lake, and luckily he woke up and we landed. <laughs> 
at 16, I was uh, lucky enough that uh, Dad uh, sent me off to Regina where I got my pilot's license before I even got my driver's license. And then finally, towards my later years, 18, 19, I was sent down south um, to a little town called Kenora, Saskatchewan, where my grandma, of all people, taught me how to drive. And I swear that was more of a challenge than learning to fly. 2006, after we sold the lodge, I bought a small little Cessna 150. And I put that on skis, and uh, I did lots of bush flying with that, country to everybody telling me you can't uh, operate a Cessna 150 as a bush airplane, I've proven them very wrong. It actually, I used to land that thing in knee deep snow, I visited all the trappers, um, I did many crazy things with that thing, gaining a few hundred hours of experience and taking some pretty big loads to my friends uh, with their supplies when I had the opportunity to and uh, visiting them. I've had over about a thousand hours now of experience. Did I have any close calls? Yeah, I had a couple close calls. Uh, the first one, uh, the fabric tore off and I lost complete control of the airplane, uh, almost ending my life there, but I managed to save the airplane and myself on that one, and I also had a rough running engine due to some bad valves uh, from overhaul cylinders. So, otherwise I think I've been pretty lucky. Uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the key to flying? Always uh, plan for the worst and hope for the best. That, that's my secret. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're bush flying, you got to remember, you know, if I'm on wheels, like on bush wheels, and I'm landing on a gravel runway, there could be a soft spot today and not a soft spot tomorrow, or vice versa. But, you know, the plane is always changing. If I'm landing on water, I mean, so there could be a log laying across. Uh, there could be uh, a boat. There could be many obstacles. You know, never mind if you go to an unknown lake, you got to check for reefs. If you're on skis, you got to be very careful for weak ice. Um, you got to worry about slush. Um, if you get stuck in slush and you don't right wear the proper boots, you jump out and you get your feet wet. I've seen pilots lose their feet. They froze and have to get them amputated. So, I mean, again, you got to prepare. Um, there's just no, uh, there's no uh, forgiveness. There's no room for error in bush flying. And by all means, I don't have the answers, but the best thing is just try to keep alive, think smart, and enjoy what I'm doing. Time for a funny trapping story. So when my dad wanted to start trapping, um, he came to the local conservation officer in LaRange and uh, he asked for a trappings license. And uh, the conservation officer looks at Mike and says, Mike, uh, you can't just go get a trapper's license. He says, well, what do you mean? He says, when I worked, uh, when I lived down south at the farm, by the Assiniboine there, he says, we just uh, applied for one and uh, got permission from the landowners. He says, it doesn't work like that up here, Mike. Uh, <laughs> he says, it's all controlled by the uh, Trappers Association. And he says, no offense, you're kind of the wrong color of skin. So, uh, however, he says, look, the guy that owns your area is by the name of Jack Rat. Uh, he's got a nickname by the name of Joker. And uh, you'll give, you contact him and maybe you can uh, work out a deal with him. So, uh, my dad phones up uh, Joker and uh, Joker starts talking and he thought to himself, my goodness, there's this uh, father and this son that want to go trapping. They live in the city, he has a little bit of trapping experience. And he says, okay, well, I'll, I'll meet you at the restaurant and we'll, we'll talk further. So we meet him at the restaurant and I could see it from Joker's perspective. He probably felt sorry seeing this father and his son. They probably didn't know their ass from a hole in the ground. <laughs> which we really didn't. And uh, so after, after you know, discussing and uh, talking about some stories of dad's, you know, younger trapping days and what's happening around Thompson Lake, Joker finally agreed he will vote us in. And actually he'd even do an emergency vote in, which is kind of unusual, because uh, otherwise you have to wait till the following year to get voted in. And dad could start trapping pretty quick. But there was a catch. The catch was leave the beaver houses alone. And dad thought to himself, oh, well, no problems. I mean, the beavers uh, only bring in 35 to $40 uh, a pelt, and the work to get a beaver done is absolutely crazy. 
it takes hours and you got to be good at it and my dad wasn't good at it so he said no have the beaver houses so they got them voted in and started trapping sadly joker got killed about a year later and there was nobody around this area for quite a few years so one day i think around 95 96 um uh, the uh, we heard a snow machine coming uh, a snow machine comes up and I mean a snow machine that's not unheard of only airplanes can land here and sure enough it was a uh, uh, Daniel Daniel senior Daniel jr. and Caroline I believe was the names and their uh, re their relatives I, I believe they were the brother to Jack or Joker if I recall right and they got talking and over these years the problem was we started getting into beaver troubles we have beaver houses right here, beaver dams being built. So dad broke that promise and started trapping the beavers. Um, it was on his license, so I mean, from a, he legally could do it, but, you know, he just wanted to respect what the agreement was, but there just came a time where he couldn't respect it anymore, and we had to look out in the best interest of our lakes. So he got talking to Caroline, and he says, why did Jack, or Joker, why did, why did he care about these beaver houses so much? Like, I mean, there's, there's not a whole lot of money for beavers. And Caroline started laughing. She says, Mike, she says, Joker didn't care about the beavers. He was growing all his marijuana plants on the beaver houses because it's got perfectly good soil. The problem with Northern Saskatchewan is we, we go down six inches a foot, you're into clay and rock. There's, there is no good, there's no good, uh, good soil here. So, <laughs> he, uh, he, you know, the beavers bring up fresh, fresh soil from the, uh, from the water and he would grow his special plants and who knows what he did with them. So, uh, that was the reason for the agreement of not trapping the beaver houses at Thompson Lake. What, what career choices? Well, I continued on being a radio tech. My dad, uh, you know, trained me up that way. And I even got into the recording studio industry. We all know that I was raised in a recording studio by my dad. And I helped him a lot of times in Saskatoon before we moved here years, uh, years ago. When we were way, way down at Audio Art there. And um, <laughs> I used to play around on the soundboard. And I had lots of fun. When dad was teaching theory in the back, I was sitting there in the soundboard. Did the, the owner and my dad trusted me. And I had lots of fun, and I learned lots. And as I got older, uh, more of that music ear, I guess I got trained listening to Dad and recognizing uh, what a good song is. Ready. So that being said, I had to try build a little recording studio in LaRange because nobody knew what they were kind of doing. I guess neither did I. Uh, just a little bit of training I had when I was a kid and just the interest in electronics and maybe having a, somewhat of an ear for it. Uh, I put together a 24-track analog recording studio and finally went digital with uh, professional stuff. And actually, before my dad passed away, he was quite impressed with my little setup and where I was going. But as time went on, I mean, I did a few albums uh, with the locals and actually got, I got recognized by the uh, NBC and APTN network. Uh, and I, I got a little bit of a name in the industry, but I mean, it was nothing like my dad. I mean, my dad w worked with Top Notch US Canada with Loverboy, and I think he did something with Sound Technician with Frank Sinatra. I'm not sure, I, I can't remember all the stories, but my dad has definitely been around and in no means I'm as good as he ever was or would be. But it was fun, it was a learning curve. I learned lots and uh, it was a blast while it lasted. But I decided to uh, take my uh, hobby slash career, whatever you want to call it, and uh, go into flying. And that's what I do. So it's been a, been a fun life. What are my plans from now? Well, maybe I'll stick around Candle Lake, continue working for the government as a radio tech as I am and doing my IT stuff up in La Ranch. But I've been offered a position up in Alaska, pulling wrenches on aircraft and uh, working on radios. So we don't know where me and Dave might end up. So that'll be uh, time will tell. Just like my dad came to Thompson Lake, maybe it's time for me to head out to Alaska 
and uh, seek out that adventure. The trappers and prospectors that created northern Saskatchewan and its economy, they've passed on now. The young generation, they don't want to be on the land. There's no money in trapping. There's hardly any work. Poverty is high. Suicide rate is the highest in the last few years. The north is changing, and that's why I left. So, I mean, in the winter time, you can skidoo into this place, but it's, it's not easy. And the trails are getting worse and worse, and nobody's trapping. Uh, nobody's keeping up with the portages. As you can tell, um, in 10 years from now, this is all gone. So this is kind of the reason why we're doing the documentary today. Somebody's asked me years ago, how happy am I, you know, leaving, you know, leaving the bush? And I just say, I'm as happy as a bush boy is to be expected. Growing up in a remote area of northern Saskatchewan presented many challenges for a young boy and his father, but taught them many valuable life skills. From fixing boat motors, snowmobiles, and generators, Jared became a mechanic. And under the guidance of an aircraft engineer, he later took his skills a step further to be able to safely maintain and fix airplanes today. Being able to communicate with the outside world while living at Thompson Lake was essential to survival. So Jared learned how to wire radios, set up antennas, and operate all kinds of equipment, which led him to get his advanced radio operator certificate and help him get in a government job as a radio technician. All the hours of self-learning spent at the lodge allowed Jared to dissect computers, build wind chargers and welders, and wire up pretty much anything. There are so many skills Jared learned while living off the grid that have shaped who he has become and have given him the opportunity to become successful not only as a pilot but as a human being. And to think, many years ago, as a young boy, he was given a choice to live in the city or to embark on an unknown adventure with his dad into the wilderness. What would have been your choice? You'll have to come up with something else. See, you're, you're good at coming up with these ideas. I just, I just take them a step further. <laughs>